All right, good morning guys. My name's Ed. I'm here from CashCat to talk to you guys about cash flow planning. Don't get me confused with the other Ed. Don't come talk to me about the uh, call to propositions. I won't send you any of those. Um, just got a, a, up here behind me here just a quick look at our agenda. This is what we're going to be running through today. Just before I get cracking with uh, talking about cash flow planning best practices, just want to tell you guys a little bit about me. Um, so I actually graduated from uni in Cardiff in 2017 and then joined Niche IFA as a, an unsung hero or, or a power planner. I'm not sure which one I prefer. Um, and shortly after joining Niche, I, uh, I started using Cash Calculator. So they, they, Niche actually had developed Cash Calc and uh, put it on the market over in 2014. So Niche actually had already had cash flow planning really heavily integrated into their advice process. Okay, and that's something that we're seeing become more and more common um, as we're getting further down the line is that firms are now deciding actually, yeah, I need to be using cash flow planning in my advice process. I need to be including it um, in all of, my, uh, all of my advice process really. Um, so as soon as I started using cash calc, I found it really, really easy to use. And just within a couple of weeks, I was actually already giving online demonstrations to uh, advisors and power planners of various different levels of knowledge and experience. Um, and shortly after I joined, Cash Calc actually became the leading provider of cash flow planning software in the UK. And now where we're at here in October, we've actually got over 9,500 registered users. So the growth didn't stop there. Um, and actually, as of Monday, so a couple of days ago, you've probably been he hearing all about TVC and Apta with your DB uh, transfer process. We've actually just launched our TVC and Apta tool as well. So it's uh, a bit of a busy time for us at the moment. Uh, just uh, up there on the left-hand side as well, you can see that's a picture of our, our office. So that's us down in South Wales, just over the bridge. Um, no, your glasses aren't wrong. That is a dragon on the roof, and its eyes even glow up in the dark. We're a little bit eccentric, but uh, haven't quite figured out how to get it to breathe fire yet. That's uh, next on the list, anyway. So what we're just looking at here, this is this is my cash flow planning best practice top tips. Okay, so the idea being, if you create a cash flow plan with these uh, tips in mind you're actually going to be creating a really robust and effective cash flow plan that you're going to be able to present to your clients. And what we're going to look through today is I'm going to go through a couple of case studies and you're going to see me bring in uh, these tips that we're looking at here. And hopefully you're going to agree with me that we're building some effective cash flow plans. So before I jump straight into the case studies, I just want to talk to you about what it actually is. So I've got two definitions up there on the board for you guys. And the first one is just a really simple definition. That's a straightforward definition. That's from us here at Cash Calc. And the second definition, that's actually uh, taken straight out of Rory Percival's guide on cash flow planning. So Rory Percival is an ex-technical uh, specialist at the FCA, um, and he's actually just released a, a guide on cash flow planning, as I said, and we assisted him in writing this guide as well. So we really recommend it to anybody who's brand new to cash flow planning, thinking about taking cash flow planning up. It's really good to see uh, where you should be get, or how you should be getting started with cash flow planning. And even if you're quite well versed in cash flow planning, you've been doing it a little while, it's good to see from a regulator's point of view what they think you should be bringing into your cash flow plans and how, you think, how they think you should be uh, presenting them. And just looking at Rory's definition for a second, just looking at that last part there, turning complex maths uh, into simple charts that clients can understand. I think that's a really key takeaway point for us here today. Um, although cash flow planning is a great tool for us as the power planners to be able to identify all the different routes possible for our client, Actually, at the end of the day, we're going to be presenting this to the client, so they actually need to be, under, they need to, be able to understand what we're showing to them, because okay, they've got to be able to get to grips with it. That actually brings us on to my top tip number one, which is keeping it simple. So like I said, the client's got to actually be able to understand what we're showing to them, um, and cash flow planning inherently tries to be complicated with all the various assumptions you're going to be using, all the rules behind the scenes that, that are going on. But it really doesn't have to be. Uh, and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean with our first case study, which is a uh, really, simple uh, really simple cash flow plan on a DC to DC transfer. Okay, so this is fairly common work. I'm sure you guys probably deal with this work on, on a fairly regular basis. And uh, what we're going to be looking at is just a client who's got a couple of different DC pots from various uh, previous employments, and we're going to look at consolidating those pots, and that's the advice that we're going to be giving him. So what we're going to show here is how we can use cash flow planning, even on a simple case like this, use a really basic cash flow plan to actually demonstrate the value of our advice. So let's jump straight into it. Um, and what we're looking at here, these are the, those various DC pots that I was talking about earlier. We can see he's got one from Zurich worth 45 grand and one from Standard Life, one from Clerical Medical as well. And we've actually got a 5% growth rate on all of these pots and that's 2.5% after inflation. We've got 2.5% inflation assumption on there as well. That actually brings me on to my first 
uh, sorry, my second top tip, which is to use realistic assumptions. So what we were seeing then, uh, cash flow planning is actually a fantastic tool for us to be able to identify all of those different options available to our client. But if we're misusing cash flow planning, it can actually be really dangerous for our client. It's going to lead them to overconfidence. Um, they're not going to be, it's going to lead to unrealistic expectations in the growth they're going to be able to get uh, and in how much money they're going to be able to take. So we were talking earlier, uh, John was talking about the capacity for loss. Um, if, if we're showing unrealistic expectations, we're going to get 10% on a cautious portfolio. It's not going to happen and your client's going to be, uh, you know, going to be a little bit worse for at the end of it. Let's just jump straight back into our case study. And because we're looking at this on a pure charges and fees basis, so we're just seeing it the uh, current DC pension pots against our, our advice, which is to, tr to consolidate them. And we've just put in the various charges associated with those pots at the moment. So we've got some he fairly hefty charges on these ones, but I'm sure we've probably all seen these kind of charges, especially associ associated with those older plans as well. So we've got a 2.3% charge on our Zurich pension, 2.6 on our clerical medical and 1.7 on our standard life. So like I said, fairly hefty charges. And once I've added all that in, got all our data in, we can actually have a look at our savings over time graph, which shows the life of those pots growing or um, reducing over our 15 year period. So our client's 50 at the moment, and we're just looking at this up until retirement age. So if we look in here, what we can see is our end age. So that's after the 15 year period up until retirement is grown by about 11 and a half thousand pounds, so just under 112,000 pounds. And those are those three shades of blue are our three different pensions growing over time. Okay, so this is, if, this is where they're at at the moment. If they did nothing and just left their pensions where they are, based on the assumptions we've put in, that's where they're gonna be in 15 years time. What we can actually do then is create a separate forecast, which is gonna to be to display uh, our advice. So our advice, like I said, is to consolidate these pension pots into one, and we've used the same assumptions as well. So we're keeping our assumptions realistic and keeping them the same as well. Again, we've just added those charges on. So now what we're looking at is we've got a platform charge, 0.25%. We've got a fund charge of 0.36. And then we've even added on our advisor charges as well. So we've got 0.5% ongoing and then a thousand pounds initial fee. Okay, so we've been really transparent with the client. We're showing them exactly what it's going to cost them if they were to take uh, our advice, showing them exactly what we're going to be charging them and giving, putting those realistic charges on. So that's the exact charges for the fund that they would propose to go into. So now we can have a look at the savings over time for this scenario. And what we're seeing already is that now at this end age, just based on charges alone, we've now got over 31 and a half thousand pounds. So we've just saved the client 20,000 pounds if they wanted to uh, take our advice. So now, well, now we've got those two built in, we just compare them side by side and present this to the client. Okay, so straight away we're, we're showing this to the client and I don't know about you guys, but if you're doing just a normal reduction in yield calculation for your DC um, process usually, and you're showing that to your client, this is 100% more effective and more powerful to showing your client the value of your advice. Okay, and this actually, uh, again, like I was saying, it's a really simple cash flow plan. This actually only took me about six minutes to build. So I've obviously been doing cash flow planning for a little while and fairly versed the system I'm showing you, but it still took me six minutes of my time and now we've got something that's actually really powerful, something that we can present to the client. Okay. So that pretty much wraps up our first case study. And now what I want to do is look at the other end of the spectrum. So um, a full cash flow model with accumulation and decumulation, probably a little bit more complicated, got a couple of different factors pulling into it. So let's just jump straight into it. What we can see here already is that we've got a couple of different pots in here. They've got, uh, this is a joint client, so this is a husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, they're from Wales by the way. Um, they've got stocks and shares ISA, 140 grand in it, and they've got a personal pension each as well, 80,000 and 100,000 respectively. And again, we've got some realistic growth rates for their attitude to risk on there as well. But now we've actually got some incomes and expenses affecting it, as we previously did with our last forecast. So we're just quickly running through it, we've got their salaries, uh, they've got a DB pension kicking in at retirement age, which is 65, and then they've got their state pensions as well. We've also got our expenditures kicking in as well, and we're looking here, we've got quite a lot of expenditures on here. So this is probably looking a bit daunting to you guys, and you're probably thinking that as power planners, uh, this is going to be me who's going to be the one to have to put all this data in, and I don't know about you guys, but data entry is probably my least favourite part of the power planning job. Don't want to, we want to reduce the amount of tediousness that we've got to go through. Um, and we were looking at before with, with time, time for Advice were telling us about uh, reducing the amount of, of that legwork that we're having to be doing, reducing the amount of data entry or double entry that we have to do. Um, and that's exactly what brings me on to my top tip number three, which is getting the client to the legwork. So what do I actually mean by get the client to the legwork? 
When I'm saying get the clients to Lego, what I mean is by sending them a data capture form. Okay, so what we do at CashCalc is send them a, on a secure link via CashCalc, and that gets sent straight to their email, and they're able to then pick that up, and it takes them through to their data capture form. Okay, so on the data capture form, they're able to enter uh, income and expenditure details, pension and investment details, um, save uh, other assets, loans and mortgages, all that kind of detail. And actually, it's a really, really effective uh, exercise for both the client and for us as the power plans. So the client's able to sit in the comfort of their own home, they're able to get their bank statement out, go through their actual expenditures. Uh, it's really good for them to be able to think, what am I actually spending? What am I actually getting in? And then it's great for us as the power plans because we're actually getting really, really accurate, up-to-date information from our client as well. Okay, and then they're actually, um, well, we're actually able to then take that information and put it straight into cash calc, so we don't have to do any of that data entry. But as well as that, we're able to push that information from cash calc into our back office providers as well. So we've got great integrations with, I know a couple of you said you with IO, we've got a great two-way integration with IO, and we're actually building um, integration with Curo as well for time for advice. But probably most importantly, your uh, client is actually able to enter their specific financial objectives as well, in their own words, onto, onto uh, a data capture form. Now, apologies, you probably can't read that at the back of the room, uh, so I'll just quickly go through what we've got here. They, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones want to be able to give both of their children a £30,000 house deposit, and they want to be able to go on a Lions tour uh, in 2033, definitely Welsh, and uh, they want to be able to spend £40,000 on a Tesla uh, when, he, when he retires, he's got a company car, not a Prius, a, a Tesla. Um, so those are the objectives that we've captured from our client, and those are their specific financial objectives that they've actually given us in their own words. Okay? So we've actually just received these from the client, and we're able to then have these objectives, save them to our file, and we've actually just got a lovely bit of compliance as well. Okay? So that's what brings us on to our top tips four and five. So it's really important for us to be able to gather those costed objectives. Okay, so for us to be able to get those specific, measurable financial objectives, if we've got those, those objectives, we, actually, we can actually then have something to plan around or work towards. And in turn, if we're gathering those specific financial values, we're actually then personalizing our advice to our client. And that's something that we're always going to be hitting home. We always want to be making personalized advice. Um, and once we've got those objectives in our cash flow, there's, nobody can argue that there's anything generic about that cash flow. It's got their specific financial goals in their own words factored into it. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. So there's those house deposits for the kids. There's the purchase of the Tesla at his retirement age. And then there's the Lions tour as well. Okay, so that's their specific financial goals in their own words actually factored into our cash flow plan. So once we've entered it all in, this is the result it's actually going to give us. So we're talking a little bit, these are, these are the, the graphs that we're going to be presented with. And uh, typically they're going to keep us, they're going to keep very client friendly as well. So we want all of this to be easy for the client to understand. Like we were talking about before, we want to be keeping it all very simple. So just quickly explain this graph to everybody here. First thing to look at is this black line. That's our expenditure. And those spikes there are their costed objectives. So that's those different specific financial goals we've factored in. Okay. Those, uh, those bars on the left-hand side here, so that's the blue and the red, those are their salaries, and they're stopping at age 65, uh, at the, which is their normal retirement age. We've then got that yellow, which is the DB pension we saw. That's kicking at 65. And then their state pensions are these green and that purple. And then this gray area is what's called the deficit covered by savings. Okay, so that's any time our income doesn't meet our expenditure, we're just going to draw from our various pots, so that ISA and those pensions we were looking at earlier, we're just going to draw on those to top up our income. So we were talking, um, John was talking earlier about having your discretionary expenditure and your essential expenditure. What we've got in here is uh, this is the, the, their discretionary and essential expenditure. And then what we're seeing is these are their incomes that are actually making up that form of it. And then we're just topping it up to, to, um, yeah, to top up their income for their, their final discretionary expenditure. So looking at our savings over time, this shows the, the value of those pots behind the scenes over the, over the whole time period. And again, this is an accumulation. So this is from start age of 50 all the way up until age 100. So we're running this forecast right to the end. Even though that's obviously going to be a little bit past our 
uh, average life expectancy, we want to extend this forecast all the way uh, up to age 100 because I think it's what, what we were saying earlier, one in four couples is going to live to age 100. So if uh, you know, one of them was to pass away, the other person's still got to carry on living, so we want to model that as well. What we're looking at here, just quickly explain this for you. We've got these two uh, green bars here. That's uh, our cash. So this darker green is our current account. So just like in real life, every time they're getting more in their pay packet than they're spending each month, they're building up cash in their bank. And this other green is their ISA that we were looking at, and then these blues are their pensions as well. So what's coming to mind here, clients got loads of money, they've got no worries at all. Um, and actually what we've done as a power plan, we've just created this report for our advisor, given it to the advisor to go out and see the client. So the advisor's gone and seen the client, and they didn't realize they're in such a favorable position, and they said, oh, actually, we don't, we don't want to walk, work up to 65. What happens if we want to retire a little bit earlier? Okay. And that brings me on to my top tip number six, which is to use multiple scenarios. So cash flow planning is a fantastic opportunity for us to display all these options available to our client, and it's really easy for us to have them all in one place to do so. Okay. Using multiple scenarios is a really easy way for, for us to break all of those different options down for them. So I've done exactly what um, they've asked. I've then taken their, uh, I've, I've then changed their retirement age to be 60. So I've taken their salary back five years and we can now see they're, re they're retiring now at age 60 and we're getting a reduced DB pension as well, just using the uh, actual reductions we've been given. But what hasn't changed is that we've still got those spikes in our expenditure. Okay, so we've still got those specific financial objectives. Those haven't changed. They still need to be accounted for. The graph looks mostly the same, except for now what we're seeing is there's a larger amount of that grey deficit covered by savings here. And actually what we're seeing is that around age 86, there's no more deficit covered by savings, they've run out of money. Okay, so we can see that a bit more clearly with our savings over time. There we are, just drawing on their pensions and running out of money about age 86. Okay, so this would actually be a, a completely fine scenario for the client. It doesn't always have to be loads of money at the end age because we've now just supplied the client with all the information they need to make their own decision. Okay, we've said to them, you can retire early, which is what you wanted to be able to do, and you can look uh, at just drawing on your pensions and enjoying your life while you can. And actually, you're gonna be live, uh, you're gonna, your pot's gonna last you for way longer than your life expectancy anyway, or just over your life expectancy. But like we were talking about before, one in four people are gonna live to age 100. What happens if they live past that age? Actually, they've got no money left. So what we can then do, and which is probably my favorite part uh, as a power planner anyway, is we can then look to add some of our technical knowledge and skill and add some planning. Looking at here is just their situation with no financial planning added on, just what they've given us put straight onto the, into the system. So we've actually added on a little bit of planning, so just a really simple bit of planning. What I've done is added a pension contribution while they're working because we saw they were building up loads of cash. And they've also added an ISA withdrawal uh, to cover those gifts to the kids as well. Okay, so that's all I've done, but actually what we're seeing is I've extended the life of the pots by about six years or so. So now we're going, uh, so, sorry, that's just, that's just where the uh, withdrawals and the contributions have been added in. Now we're seeing we're actually uh, way past our normal life expectancy, and that all we've done is just added on that tiny bit of planning, just a really simple bit of planning. But actually that's the great thing with cash flow planning in general, is that there is so many different routes we could have gone down there. That was just a really simple bit that I just... Um, just thought up off the top of my head, but actually probably everybody in this room has got an idea of something they could have done on that cash flow plan to add some value to the client. For instance, they had a mortgage running up to age 65. We could have potentially looked at taking some PCLS at age 60 and then paying off that mortgage. That again would have potentially increased the uh, life of their pots as well. So that actually brings us back to our cash flow planning best practice top tips. And we'll just do have a quick recap through what we've run through today. So we looked at keeping things simple, showed you how a really basic cash flow plan can actually add an incredible amount of value to your advice. We looked at using realistic assumptions and, and mainly actually the danger around using unrealistic assumptions for your client. And we looked at my favorite tip of getting the client to do the legwork, reducing some of that data entry for us as power planners, uh, increasing our efficiency. Uh, and we talked about having those costed objectives and personalized advice, having the specific measurable financial values, which in turn is going to personalize all of our advice that we're given to our client. And then we looked at how multiple scenarios is probably the best way for us to be able to display those different options to our client in an easy way. But actually what we haven't looked at, or an additional tip we've got added on there, is number seven, which is it's better to be approximately right 
rather than precisely wrong. Okay, so what do I, what do I actually mean by that? It's a little bit vague. Um, you know, cash flow planning, we, we can sometimes say is actually, a cash flow plan is actually outdated as soon as you've given it to the client. Okay, as soon as you've provided them with that cash flow plan and they go off and they uh, buy some petrol or get a takeaway, that's an expenditure they potentially haven't told you about and already your cash flow plan is going to be a little bit out of kilter. Okay, so it's important for us not to get bogged down in the minute details, trying to get everything down to the pounds and pence to the nth degree and just look at the overall big picture and make sure that we're actually hitting home the important points. Can they achieve their goals? Can they achieve uh, the expenditure they want to require? Are they able to do what they want to do? Okay, we're personalizing it to them. And actually, if we're already focusing on those cost objectives and that personalized advice, we're already halfway there to satisfying the new TVC and APTA requirements that have just come in force as of Monday, Monday this week. And I said I wanted to talk a little bit about it, I'll just briefly go over it with you guys. So uh, TVC and APTA, TVC is a prescribed set of calculations that have been given to us uh, by the FCA. And to make it, make it a little bit easier for you guys, CashCalc have actually released a tool uh, to help you satisfy all these TVC and APTA requirements. Okay, it helps break down the process for you, uh, makes it really quick and easy for us to go through that process, which potentially for some of us, uh, like we were talking about before, I don't know if anybody's read uh, the new FCA handbook that's come out. I haven't. Uh, <laughs> but it's actually going to make it a little bit easier for us to go through all of that. Uh, there's a brief look at our tool. Uh, TVC is actually a replacement for what we probably know as TVAS. Uh, and like I said, it's a prescribed set of calculations. The APTA, however, is a framework rather than a prescribed set. Um, and our APTA tool is a gated version of the cash flow tool that we were just looking at with the, uh, uh, the case studies. And it's going to help guide you through satisfying your APTA requirements as well. So just to finish off, guys, uh, I mentioned Rory earlier as well. We actually we work quite closely with him, and he's actually helped us to develop this tool as well. Uh, to, and to make your lives even easier, we've actually released a short guide on TVC and APTA uh, to try and smooth that out for you. Um, but if you're taking on board some of the tips we've been running through today, taking on board the top tips that I've, uh, I've shown you guys today, um, you're gonna, you guys are going to have no problem in satisfying those APTA requirements. And most importantly, you're going to be providing a really, really excellent service to your clients. So that's pretty much it from me, guys. Thanks very much for listening. Um, I'm here for the rest of the day and for lunch if you want to grab me and come and talk to me. And I've got a couple of my colleagues here today as well. If you don't like me, you can talk to them as well. All right.